Well, hi, it is time yet for another updated twist on the Wednesday night Bible study that you may have grown up with. Uh, tonight, today, Reverend Wendy Jerome will offer readings from the Hebrew and Christian scriptures that make up the Bible. We'll cover some of the Christian basics and explore the Bible's themes, contradictions, and curiosities. Well, you may have heard about Adam and Eve, but have you heard about Adapa? It's time for a little storytelling, but this time with a twist. This time we're going to look at the Sumerian creation story. I'm really quite excited to hear about this myth. So Wendy, how should we get started? Let's jump in. And I'm glad you mentioned the Sumerians. We should probably give people a sense of who these great people were. Okay, you all have seen maps of the Near East. Okay, so you know the Tigris and Euphrates they come rushing down out of these mountains in Turkey, and then they go into the Persian Gulf. Now, there are snows in Turkey's mountains. You can ski up there. And so in the spring, they come rushing down, and they fill the rivers, and it's a swampy mess, a great chaos. The Sumerians were the first people who lived down. Well, it looks like she has gotten disconnected. I am so sorry. We'll give her a second to get uh, reconnected here. Um, just one moment. Ah, there we go. We got her connected. So go ahead and uh, lower your volume on your laptop. We'll get you back into this whole thing, everyone. Okay. Here you go. You ready? Ready. Okay. And. So there's their very first city is called Ur, strangely, you are Ur. So we talk about things that are really old as Ur, right? And their very first city had an interesting um, god in charge of it, and his name was Anu. And if you notice, we get the name of a Greek god here, and we also get the name of one of our planets, Uranus, right? Okay. So the Sumerians... Um, who live down in these marsh wetlands where people, they live off the, in the wetlands, and they fish, etc., etc. Their civilization was really strong. 3,500 years ago, they had temples, everything. Their civilization, they're, they're the ones who get us started. They had their own language. They This is quite unique. She's over at FUS right now, and she's connected to the Wi-Fi. So I wonder what's happening. Because they were watering their fields with... Um... And I think, you know what? I'm going to reach on out to her. Yeah, I apologize, everyone. Sometimes we can have some technical difficulties in this time of COVID. Uh, with everything going on, we're doing everything so remote right, right now, now that we have no chance to work on each other's systems. So if anyone has any problems with their system, then we have all sorts of problems. Okay. I I'll think what going. we're going to do, yeah, what I think we're going to do is we're going to bring David in on this too, and so that the two of you can then go back and forth. And if you have more technical issues, we can fall back and forth between David and you. How's that okay. sound? Okay, great. Awesome. I'm so glad that we're going to get this all worked out. Okay. Go for it. All right. So um, gradually, these Sumerians, these Sumerians are brilliantly creative people. They're creating writing, poetry, hymns, a fantastic mythology. And they come to be under the, under the governance of some people upstream, um, the Akkadians. But the Akkadians love the Sumerian myths, so they take them, add their own gods' names to them. So in their stories, the god Ur is a sub-god under their god, da 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 And it keeps moving upstream, Sumerians, Akkadians. Finally, we're going to get to Babylonians. Finally, Assyrians, then we're going to get Neo-Babylonians, and on to Persians. It'll take a thousand years for the, for the folks that are producing the most writing to be reproducing and modifying the Sumerian myths. So what we're talking about, eventually, essentially, when we talk about Babylonian myths, we're talking about things that had their seeds in Sumerian times, like 3,500 BCE, if not earlier. Um, pretty fantastic stuff. But I'm going to draw back from that, and I want to 
and I jump in with the things that you looked at a few months ago when you were looking at the creation stories in Genesis, because you were working with David, and you guys are sharp. You picked up a lot of things. There are just all kinds of discrepancies. What's wrong with these stories? I think you noticed that there were two creation stories. There's one that's got a systematic seven days, and it's got watery chaos and, and a whole procedure. Every day something new is created. And then there's another one where the creation of man is the most important. It's totally humanocentric. But man, male, a male man is created, and then a woman is made from his rib. In the first creation, human beings are created, female and male, simultaneously, right? All kinds of... And then we get the whole, you know, in the Garden of Eden story that is just weird beyond belief. I mean, what's with this God that... Um, I mean, these people bite into the fruit that gives them from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they discover that they're standing around in their birthday suits and they make themselves clothing, right? And then God appears and just reads them the riot act and gives them another set of clothing. What's with two sets of clothing? Uh, another problem is there are two trees. When he creates that Garden of Eden, he's got a tree of the knowledge of good and evil and a tree of life. The one he tells them not to eat from is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Maybe he doesn't mind if they eat from the tree of life, whatever that means. But we only hear that they get punished for biting into the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Strange. He also... Well, looks like we're still having some technical difficulties. So. Looks like some technical difficulties. Darn it. Well, we'll, we'll get her back. Oh, there she is. There she is. Okay. Hey, all right. He, he says to them, look, guys, you bite into this, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and on that day ye shall die. Well, they bite into it, and they don't die. So this Lord God is deceiving them. He told them a lie. The person who doesn't lie, if we look at this story, remember that the serpent offers the fruit to Eve, saying to her, let me find this lovely piece. Um, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of this, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, this woman wants intelligence. She wants wisdom. I'm, my hat is off to this woman. She chooses the fruit because she wants wisdom. Okay? But then she's instructed. The snake is telling the truth. The snake is telling the truth. The Lord God tells lies. Okay? These things are more than spooky. They definitely, they revolt our sense of justice, I think. Well, those problems leap out at us. Other problems about this story, you know, two different creations. Hmm. One takes seven days. Hum male and female are created together. The other, hmm, just happens. The second one, human beings are created out of dust. Now, where do you think that story comes from? My theory is that's the story that comes from Canaan. Because what do they've got? They've got a really dry climate. It's desert, you know, palm trees, da 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 da, the whole thing. Dust. That's what they, and for moisture on the ground, they get dew in the morning, and that's it. They don't have a lot more to water their plants. It's not, it's not super farm country, you know, it's not Iowa. And the other one, seven days, what we know about the Sumerians 
the Akkadians, the Babylonians, is that they used to do fabulous rituals. They had these big temples, you know, the grand gate of Ishtar, the hanging gardens, the whole thing. And we have on their cuneiform tablets all of their prayers and rituals. And they did things using magic numbers. Seven, oh my God, of course, seven. They have a creation story that is not exactly the same seven things, but their creation story called the Enuma Elish does create, it does have creation happening in the same, very same order that we see in Genesis. There's first chaos, from chaos, somebody creates something firm, a firmament, and then um, there are heavenly bodies, and then human beings, that order, okay? And you can see why. If, if this story comes originally from the Sumerians who lived down in, a, in the wetlands, basically, the creation of um, sort of substantial land, something you can actually build a temple on, would be very important, okay? Well, we're going to get back to the marshlands. Um, I want to say something that I, I was just reading about this, and I had, I, I, this is new for me, but I was just very excited to read about this. Babylonian, where we, where we find the myth I'm going to share with you tonight, the myth of Adapa, it's found in four tablets, but copies of them are, are in different places. So one copy is over in Egypt. You remember old Akhenaten? And he had a whole lot of, um, he had a huge library that gets baked. You know, the clay tablets get baked and thus they're kept forever and um, they get abandoned. So the Tel El Amarna, um, what they're, they're called the Tel El Amarna letters, contains this huge library. Well, it contains a lot of Babylonian material because Babylonian was number one, the diplomatic language of the ancient world. So this is 1400 BCE, we find a copy of the myth of Adapa, of part of it, among these, these documents from 1400 BCE. We also find all of their diplomatic documents. If you're going to go into the foreign service of Egypt, if you're going to go into the foreign service of the um, Ionian islands of Greece, everybody uses Babylonian language. And there are even practice copies for the Egyptian scribes and the Turkish scribes to study so that they can learn Babylonian. Um, we find their practice copies. And one of the things they practice on is copies of the Sumerian myths, right? Which have been translated into Babylonian. Um, so, Babylonian language is widespread. We have to believe that people were exposed to the material from the Tigris and Euphrates valleys, right? We have something else. Um, I, I had a misspent youth. I'll just frankly admit it. I didn't read the Bible. That's secondary for me. The first thing I was really exposed to when I didn't know what to do, I would wander into the Oriental Institute in Chicago. And the Oriental Institute is this big old building. It's a storehouse. Mr. Rockefeller, who had a lot of money and a very serious Baptist faith, very serious Baptist faith, so believed that if the Middle East were explored, there would be all kinds of proof for everything that happened in the Bible. So he financed a lot of archaeological expeditions, and he brought out a lot of material, and it's stored in this huge Oriental Institute in Chicago. What there are there are tons of cylinder seals, giant stone statues, wonderful things. But one of the things, oh, cuneiform too. And in the basement, the students are all learning how to read Sumerian and Akkadian and all of these ancient languages on the clay tablets that were baked, okay? So among these clay tablets, we can read these myths. The creation myths of the, of the Sumerians, um, and which were appropriated by the Akkadians and then appropriated by the Babylonians. They keep being translated because everybody loves the stories. We learn from them a few things. One of the things we learn is that these people who wait for spring floods 
to bring the world back to greenness and fertility, their first sign of spring is the little baby snakes crawling out of the mud along the river. And little baby snakes, bigger snakes, especially mommy and daddy snakes in flagrante delicto, making more baby snakes, all of these are symbols of vitality, of life, of health, which is why the medical our medical profession's symbol is the caduceus. It's a staff with snakes wound around it. And why, for example, the god Hermes of the Greeks carries this stake with snake on it, right? Snakes wrapped around this. This is a symbol of health. The snake is a symbol of life, youth, vitality, fertility, all the things that make life worth living. Snakes are good. Snakes are wonderful. And in fact, of course, the Sumerians and then the Akkadians and the Babylonians after them, taking up their myths, they have two magic snake gods who are super gods of fertility. There's a god Tammuz and there's a god Ningazida. And these fellows have wonderful, well, they have amorous adventures, but they basically do wonderful things for people's lives. These guys are beneficial two beneficial guys who sometimes appear in the form of snakes, okay? And we can see them on these nifty little cylinder seals. Okay, what's a cylinder seal? Well, you're a Babylonian trader. You're sending off your jars of oil. You seal it with some clay, and then you push, press into it a stamp that shows that that's coming from your olive trees. And that stamp is, um, you kind of roll it, it's, it's about the size of your thumb. And it's round and it's, you, you, it's made out of stone and you had some fancy guy carve it for you and you had him carve into it your favorite story, your favorite myth. And so we have a bunch of these cylinder seals which show us pictures of the gods, pictures of all these myths. They're all, they're in, all of these myths are portrayed on these cylinder seals. And we get to see Tammuz and Ningazita on the cylinder seals. All right. Um, so we not only have the cuneiform tablets, we also have the pictures from these people's myths. Um, now we have another. We have other little bits of, of, of evidence that are coming in here that I want to prepare for you before I tell you the myth of Adapa. Until the 1950s, and the government was pushing them out of it, the people who lived down on the mouth of the where, the, where the Tigris and Euphrates went into the Persian Gulf, they're living in wetlands, and they build their houses out of reeds. They bundle them up, and they, you know, make them into sort of a Quonset, Quonset hut, right? And there are photographs of these folks with their wonderful, and they make their boats out of reeds. They bundle a bunch of reeds together and, and you know, you get enough of them together and you can, it'll float, right? You can go around, you can do fishing and stuff on it. And so these people will have reed houses, right? Um, we have pictures of these reed houses. They're th ancient because this is what they've been doing since Sumerian times, okay? 3,500 years ago, these people who lived in the wetlands were making houses out of bundles of reeds, all right? Now, I'm going to show you not my very, um, this is my not very good picture, but it's of a reed house of a god, because, of course, gods have to be like people, right? So they are going to have houses, let's see, I've got to remember I go backwards from what I'm supposed to do. There we go. There we go. Whoops, whoops, whoops. There I am. Okay, so there is a reed house. You can see how it's curved over the top. But this being the house of a god, on the cylinder seals, when the house of the god is portrayed, it's a reed house, but it has, because it's a god's house, it has two giant pillars in front. Now, what are those giant pillars? They're not gonna be stone because we're down there living in the wetlands, right? Even even when the myths are used by the Babylonians later, it's not going to be stone pillars. No, these are big tree trunks. Somebody brought some tree trunks over from maybe the cedars of Lebanon, wherever. 
there are trees down there. So these were really precious. So this is a sign that you're really, you're, you're hot stuff if you've got pillars in front of your house. So that's really, that's gonna be a God's house, right? You know, on, at least on the cylinder seals, right? Okay, now I'm gonna talk about finding the myth of Adapa. I began, I began and got off track there. One copy is found among the Amarna, the Tel El Amarna Library in Egypt, and it is 1400 BCE, at least, okay, by date. Um, and then other copies of it, translated into Babylonian, have been found in Nineveh in Ashurbanipal's library. The Assyrians beat up Ashurbanipal and they burned his city and they burned his library, which was great because, it, you know, again, you burn those clay tablets and everything stays on them forever. It's terrific. So we have the com almost the complete myth of Adapa. It's a great little story. Um, it starts out, okay, and, and as I said, it's at least the oldest tablet is from Tel El Amarna, 1400, but the story is, of course, much, much, much older. Okay, it is a story about a little god's competition. What happens is the head god, a fellow named Anu, Sumerian god, right? He is super smart, he's wonderful, he's bored. No, there's nothing going on. I'm just being a god every day. I get up every day and I'm a god and I feel divine and that's it. He has a fellow god named Ea. Ea is the god of wisdom. And Ea is not going to put up with boredom. To handle his boredom, he creates a little man. The little man's name is Adapa. And little Adapa is clever. Little Adapa learns how to make bread. Little Adapa learns how to make clay pots. He's a Little Adapa learns how to make a house out of reeds. Little Adapa makes his own boat. Little Adapa worships the gods. He knows how to worship the gods and keep the altars clean. He's very dutiful. And Little Adapa knows how to make his own fishnets and he goes out fishing. He's a very clever little thing. And Aya just loves watching him. It's fascinating watching this little human being. It's very exciting. So Aya, you know, at, at some point, I'm sure he probably says to Anna, oh, you should see what I've got. I've got a human being, they're so cute. But Anna is missing this at this point. So Adapa is out fishing one day in the Persian Gulf and the south wind comes up and the south wind in the shape of a bird on the cuneiform tablets, whooshes at Adapa's boat and spills all the fish out. And Adapa is mad because that's work and that salt wind just stole it. So he yells, you, and he bashes off a wing of the south wind. It loses one of its wings. So there's no south wind, you know. It has to go home and wait till it grows a new wing. Okay, this is not good. The south wind goes and talks to the head god Anu and says, hey, that little guy that Ea has, well, he wrecked my wing. And Anu says, oh, oh, I'm gonna have to see about this. So Anu says a not to be denied invitation to Adapa to come to his divine house there will be a meeting. Well, Adapa swallows and he consults with Ea, his sponsor. Ea, the god of wisdom, says to Adapa, this could be bad. Okay, here's what you do. Um, loosen your hair so it looks like you've been mourning and just wear rags. You know, wear rags, look like, look like you're, you're mourning, you're really sad, you're sorry, you don't know, look, look decrepit. Also, this guy is powerful and mean, and he might poison you. So when you get up there and meet with him, don't eat anything. Don't drink anything. It could be the end of you. So Adapa does as Aya suggests. This little human loosens his hair, 
puts some ashes in it and puts on some rags and goes tromping up to the palace. palace. It's a reed hut with two trunks in front of it. Okay, He goes tromping up to Anu's royal home. And there are illustrations of this on cylinder seals. Okay. He stops outside because there are two gods, each one wrapped around one of the pillars. One is Tammuz and one is Ningazita. And the two gods in the form of serpents say to Adapa, God, you look awful. What's going on? And Adapa says, oh, I'm mourning because, you know, on earth, it's so sad. We really miss our favorite gods. We really miss Tammuz and Ingazita. We miss them something fierce. We really want them to come back. Which bends the heart of Tammuz and Ningazita. So Tammuz and Ningazita say, let's soften Anu up. So Tammuz and Ningazita say nice things to Anu, the head god. When Adapa goes in to meet with Anu, Anu finds him a delightful fellow. He offers him clothing, because you are kind of wearing rags, buddy. He offers him clothing and he, a feast. He offers him food and drink, and they have a wonderful conversation. Adapa is interesting, you know. But Adapa doesn't eat and he doesn't drink. And pretty soon Adapa, you know, enough of, of this tension. I mean, I like the God and all, but I, you know, time for me to go. I've got to be back to earth because I've got to like get my bread out of the oven and that's kind of stuff you have to do as a human. So Adapa goes back and he's hiking back to his home. And Anu says, oh, dang, look at that. He didn't even touch the food on his plate. Oh, shoot. If only he had eaten that, that was the food and drink of eternal life. If he had eaten that, all human beings would live forever. Ea, who catches up with Adapa, says, oh gosh, I'm sorry, I had no idea. I had no idea. But Anu is a benevolent God. Anu sends after Adapa, a little goddess of medicine. She will be with humankind. Humankind will get sick, humankind will die, but they will have this little help to comfort them. Now that's the myth of Adapa. It explains a few things about Genesis, does it not? Um, I'm wondering if you're beginning to have thoughts. Is this beginning to come together? Do you see how the serpents are good? Do you see how the gods can be capricious and wrong? I'm not going to say more because I think you can draw your own conclusions. <laughs> I think here's the here's a little tragic piece. At the end of you know these these, we've been working on translating these cuneiform um, little tablets you know ever since the 30s and 40s, 1930s and 1940s, and the scholars will give us you know translations of the Babylonian creation myths, and then they will say at the end of this, well, the similarities to the to the Jewish and Christian Bible are remarkable, but we mustn't think, we mustn't discredit the Jewish and Christian Bible. It's almost as if they're afraid to bring this up. And that's troubling. That's troubling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, no. I like somebody, oh, Terrell Brown said, I thought gods were infallible, or is that just the Pope? <laughs> Well, I hadn't heard that story. I had not heard that story. No, me neither. No. Isn't it's tiny, but isn't it wonderful? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
No, the, the, the Tigris and Euphrates gods, you know, the Sumerian, Akkadian, Babylonian, Assyrian, no, they make mistakes. They lose their temper. They're goofy. Um, they get overpowered by lust. And, um, oh, no. And some of them are just really sweet, and we like them a lot. And they sneak in everywhere. I was just, I, okay, I celebrate Hanukkah. So I was lighting my Hanukkah candles the other night, and I'm realizing the candle that you light with the little lighter candle. In Hebrew, it's called the shamash. Well, shamash is the name of the Sumerian, Akkadian, and Babylonian god of the sun. Mm. Ah. If there was not, you know, of course, these people are influencing each other. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, how much, how much of the Bible is original? No, no. And, and you know, we're still, you, the scholars are still, still hesitant to tell how recent the Bible is, that it may have been assembled after the seventh century BCE. It, it, it's not that old. No, 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 it's not that old. And when you read the, um, the really old stuff, the old Yahweh, he's, he's, not, he's not much of a god. He's sort of a magic guy that you have to placate. Yeah. Um, is that, that's not real Judaism. That's like pre-Judaism, mm -hmm. I'd have to say. It's magic worship. It's not religion. There is um, one question from Terrell, and I'll throw it up here on the screen. Oh, good. I apologize, it's putting it over, right over your head, and I apologize, but no, I rather great. like the claim that there is only one God, but that God gives a command to put no other gods before him. Doesn't that imply that she or he knows that there is more than one? Yes, and in fact, in Genesis, even, even when he's talking about, we have to hurry them. Okay, now those two, they've, they've eaten from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We'd better get them out of the Garden of Evil, out of Eden, quick, because they could eat of the Tree of Life and be immortal like us. Now, it's not Queen Victoria. That's not the royal we. It's like us. Why is God saying like us? He's talking to a whole, he's talking to a court of gods, right? There's a whole court of them sitting around him, as in the Sumerian myths. The gods have this huge, they get together for meetings and they sit and talk about stuff together and they make decisions and they have arguments and stuff. Um, it's all, there's an us and Yahweh just, yeah, there's several gods. And this whole thing of, okay, even it even holds over into Jesus, right? Jesus is supposed to sit on the right hand of God. Why would it make any difference if <laughs> there's only one, you know, there's only one God? No, no. It's a holdover from everybody sitting in a circle. All the divines are sitting in a circle. And the best place is to be at the guy's right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Nope. Nope. Oh. nope. That is actually, actually a pretty good joke. Somebody asked John Dominic Crossan once what, what he thought, what they thought, um, what he thought that God would think of the war, making war on Saddam Hussein would be, and what he thought of Bush and da 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 da. And John Dominic Crossan said, Well, let's just put it this way um, Jesus would probably prefer the left because he sits at the <laughs> right hand of God. Can you see where he's looking? <laughs> so, there you go. <laughs> Yep, absolutely. Well, mm -hmm. well, and of course, John, John Donovan, Dominic Crossan, for those who don't know your Bible scholarship, uh, what taught at Loyola. And so I'm sure that he uh, uh, made a pilgrimage down to uh, the Oriental Institute. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, because that is an amazing thing. You know, the, the real Indiana Jones uh, was one of the people who gathered that material. And there, you know, there was a professor at the University of Chicago who this was modeled on originally. Uh, bringing this stuff sure. back, yeah. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, yeah, um, uh, I met him once. He was in the nursing home that uh, that all the uh, University of Chicago professors went to. Um, yeah, but yes, no, absolutely. I mean, he didn't carry around a bullwhip and and you know and 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 and, 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 and dodge fast bullets and stuff. But uh, he did bring a lot of this stuff back. 
uh, uh -huh. uh, to the University of Chicago, which is just full of this kind of stuff. And sitting there, um, you know, I had no idea myself, but, you know, wandering around in there uh, one day, you know, there's L, there's the great God that, that becomes the, the God, you know, in uh, uh, in the Bible is L. He's about this tall, right, and made out of gold. And uh, by golly, there he is. Um, so El Elo Elohim is just sitting there in a glass case. Uh, but it, but that's the uh, the amazing stuff about that that uh, museum is just how much of it um, reveals uh, so much about what you're just exactly what you're saying. You know, it's just amazing stuff. But yeah, yeah, but. Um, yeah, the we the, the Bible is the, the whole the, the Canaanite and and what becomes the well, is there any difference between Canaanites and the people who become the Jews? Not really. Um, so, but how, how heavily they are influenced by all the Tigris and Euphrates cultures? It's huge. Yeah, yeah. And it was the whole world, as we know. You know, yeah. <laughs> just it more than once. You know. Yeah. Right. Oh my God. Yeah. That even the Egyptians are studying yeah. Babylonian. Wow. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, and, and a lot of the uh, a lot of the clay tablets at the Oriental Institute are, as you were saying, uh, practice tablets. Right. They were the uh, you know the scribe. You know, you had to get your notebook out and you know and do your, your little uh, you know, <laughs> that, right. And, but it doesn't rain, so it survived forever. <laughs> yeah, right. It's super. It's just great. Oh, that, I'm so glad. Yeah, you've been there. Gosh. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyone who goes to, uh, if, if you happen to be in Chicago for some reason, go to the University of Chicago campus and go to the Oriental Institute. Uh, and it, it, it's a hoot uh, because, yeah, yeah, this guy just, they were hauling this, you know, tons and tons of you know, stuff back. <laughs> yeah. There's a 30 ton giant stone um, five legged lion. Yeah. in there, which must have just cost a mint to bring back. Oh, yeah. I think about Rockefeller spending all this money on this because he knew they were going to prove that the Bible was true, mm -hmm. which hasn't actually worked out too well. Didn't work out so well, did it? But, no, you know. <laughs> no. But it, but it did open up all this archaeology for us. So I am grateful right. to old Rockefeller. So yeah. if, I, if, if I can ask, um, this has been amazing content then, and I really like hearing more about Adapa. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of really great stuff out there to dig into this. Where would I go if I was wanting to dig in to learn more about Ooh. these myth stories and to get that foundation of understanding that we need when we are trying to study and understand um, the religious backgrounds that, that we have? So if I was looking for Sumerian texts, where would I go to study? Um, where would you go to study? I think you can at the, well, we have an Akkadian expert at the University of Minnesota, <laughs> but um, I don't think you can take Sumerian there. You have friends who do Sumerian, right, Justice? Um, and you were mentioning their website, which is... Well, I was, mo yeah, so there is the uh, Assyrianologist um, uh -huh. is their primary, they're formerly, they're, they're foremost experts on Assyriology, but they also yep. understand Sumerian, and that would yep. be uh, the husband and wife team, Dr. Joshua Bowen and his wife, Megan Lewis, mm -hmm. um, they make up the digital Hammurabi um, team that's out there. I'll throw their link into chat for anyone who's interested in who they are. Yep. Um, they, they do a lot of crazy stuff and um, you can look on YouTube and find massive amounts of content as they go through and they study and they break it down. They each also teach um, mm -hmm. Assyrian and Sumerian languages on YouTube for anyone who's curious to learn. Ooh, let's learn. Um, I read some pretty interesting guys. Um, one guy is Theodore Gaster, G-A-S-T-E-R. He's now dead, but he wrote wonderful, he wrote a book called The Oldest Stories in the World. And oh. he, on purpose, this guy, I think he's Jewish, um, but he he was not afraid to say, look, all these stories from the Old Testament, they're actually Sumerian. Um, so Theodore Gaster is a great source. Um, another fellow named Kramer, K-R-A-M-E-R, -E Samuel Noah Kramer is great. Um, another guy named Alexander Heidel, H-E-I-D-E-L. And he wrote, he did a translation of the texts of the all of the 
big old cuneiform texts of the Babylonian Genesis story, which, and he did the research on them. This, you know, the, it, it, which is like a thousand lines. This guy really worked. Yeah. So, um, wow. can I type those fellows' names in somewhere? I guess I could chat. Yeah, just send them to me and I'll make sure to include them in our description and stuff. Okay, Excellent. all right. Yay. Yay. Yeah. Well, we are hitting right at the top of the time where we need to call it for today. Um, but we're not done. Thank you, Wendy. I've got some notes to work on here. Okay. But we're not done. Um, we do have our after party. Um, I'm right now getting ready to throw in the after party link into chat. And I made it a special link this time. So we've had problems with links in the past. So this is a little bit cleaner, a little bit smaller, a little bit tinier. Um, and I'll throw this here for you too, Wendy. Um, and I would love to have you guys. We're going to go ahead and do some deep dives. And Wendy will be there to answer any questions that you may have. And we can kind of go into some more uh, dialogue and conversation around all of this information. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. We will be back Wednesday. And David, what are we talking about next Wednesday? Oh, what are we talking about? This time we're going to have to figure out how come there uh, are two different stories of Noah. I mean, uh, you, you know, yeah, well, yeah, then Wendy, you're going to have to revisit it <laughs> because there happen to be some precursors to that one too. So uh, how, how many animals really got on that boat? It's important to know. <laughs> That'll be next Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And then we have coffee and wisdom every morning, weekdays, um, 9 o'clock. We'd love to have you. We're doing some great study of the mainline denominations here in the United States and the history that they have with the religious movement. What do you have talking about tomorrow, David? Tomorrow, we're going to talk about how, uh, in actual fact, uh, what we think of as the uh, civil rights movement with the African American church is a, uh, actually based on a lot of uh, free thinking uh, communists and, and free thinkers and such uh, who set up the idea uh, for non uh, for nonviolent resistance before the churches started adopting this. And uh, so, yeah, so we're going to go back and look at the real deal. So there you go. Oh. Well, that is absolutely awesome. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you again, Wendy. And if anyone wants to follow you and know more of what you're doing, do you have any social media presence or anything? Not really. You can email me. That's fine. Me. We can sure email you. Fix that. <laughs> <laughs> well, definitely reach out to us and we can make sure to get you in contact with Wendy. If you have any questions or anything along those lines, you can hit us up in the comment sections below on the YouTube videos. Please take a moment to like, subscribe and share this content out with others. We'd love to learn more and learn from you what your thoughts are uh, about what we've discussed and have these conversations on. Well, for all of us, uh, it's time for us to sign on off. So thank you all so much for joining us and we hope to see you next Wednesday. Yay. Bye-bye.